Praise the Lord. Greeting. This is Brother Clinton. Welcome to my apartment once again. It is the seventh day of the week and the 24th day of January, the year of our Lord, 2015, 5775. I greet you on this day and I want to share with you something from the scripture. I have my Bible open to 1 Corinthians chapter 2. This is my authorized King James Version of the Holy Scriptures. If you speak English, this is the Word of God. You don't need to understand Greek and Hebrew to understand it. All you need to do is understand English and do what it says. A good understanding of all they that do his commandments, saith the scripture. Light is sown for the righteous, the scripture says. Blessed be the name of the Lord. So let's leave, let's look in the scripture and may God bless the reading of his word. I want to look at 1 Corinthians 2.14, but in order to do so, we kind of need to back up a little bit in order to understand the context. So let's go to verse 11 and read from 11 and following. For what man knoweth the things of a man save the spirit of man which is in him? Even so the things of God knoweth no man but the Spirit of God. Now we have received not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit which is of God, that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God. Which things also we speak, not in the words which man's wisdom teacheth, but which the Holy Ghost teacheth, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. But the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him. Neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. Praise the Lord. And it's hard to stop there, because this letter is so wonderfully written, and there's so much revelation in every verse of this precious letter. But I'm going to stop there for purposes of explaining to you the thing that I, that's in my heart to share with you. Verse 14, But the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him. Neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. The title of this video lets you know that theologians are not Christians. And a lot of you are watching this video because that title has caused you to be a little bit indignant and to watch this video to tear it apart and, and to, uh, to argue and all sorts of other things. And if that's your motive, then I tell you right now that you're not going to receive anything from this video because I'm a Christian, I'm a priest, I'm part of a royal priesthood. And as it is written, if any man speak, let him speak as the oracles of God. And I intend to do just that. Okay, I'm not a theologian. I am a Christian, and there is barely a difference, and I'm going to show you that difference from the Scripture. Let's back up a little bit. Um, let's go back to verse 11 and, and just kind of go through it a little bit more slowly. For what man knoweth the things of a man, save the spirit of man which is in him? Of course. Okay? Nobody knows the things that are in your heart unless you do something or say something to let other people know. The only one who can know what's in your heart is God Almighty. Okay, No man or no devil no other force, no other entity in the universe can know what is in your heart unless you do or say something to show it. Okay? For what man knoweth the things of a man save the spirit of man which is in him? Even so, in the same way, the things of God knoweth no man but the spirit of God. Okay? The spirit of God. He is the only one who knows what's in his own heart. No man can know what's in the heart of God unless God reveals it to him. Period. This is why Jesus said, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. These things are spiritually discerned. Now, verse 12, now we have received, we, okay, now when you read this letter, it's very important to understand that this is a letter written by Paul, the apostle of Jesus Christ, to the church at Corinth. Okay, if you desire to see how the church at Corinth became the church at Corinth, then look in the 18th chapter of the book of Acts and you'll see how Paul preached the gospel to them and, and they were baptized in the name of the Lord and received the Holy Ghost. Okay, Just as every other apostle preached, so did Paul. And just as every other Christian became a Christian, so did the Christians at Corinth. Okay, So if you haven't obeyed the gospel of Christ, if you haven't been born of water and of the Spirit by repentance and baptism in Jesus' name for the remission of your sins, and receiving the Holy Ghost with the manifestation of speaking with other tongues and prophesying, as the scripture says. If you haven't obeyed the gospel of Christ and become a Christian, then this letter can reveal to you a lot of things about the church, but it's not addressed to you. So you can't assume, you can't read it as if it were addressed to you if you're not part of the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay, And I don't say that to, to slam you or slander you or, or make you angry. If it does make you angry, I have no apology, but I don't say it to make you angry. I say it because that's the truth. This letter is written to the church at Corinth, and if you are part of the church of Jesus Christ, you can accept it as being written to you. But if you're not part of the church of Jesus Christ and you read it as if it were written to you, then you're going to get into a lot of error. Okay, 
for the simple reason that it is addressed to the church. It is addressed to the saints. Look in, in chapter 1, verse 2. Unto the church of God, which is at Corinth, to them that are sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints, with all that in every place call upon the name of Jesus Christ our Lord, both theirs and ours. Okay, so if you're in Jesus Christ, this letter is written to you. If you're not, then it's not written to you. You can still read it and gain some information from it, but don't read it as if it were written to you. Okay, I think I've already said that enough times to make my point clear. Verse 12, chapter 2, verse 12. Now we have received, and that's the reason why I explained this to you, because of the word we. Okay, when Paul says we, he's talking about himself and the church, not people that are not in the church. Now we have received, not the spirit of the world, but the spirit which is of God, that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God. Okay, notice how he said, not the spirit of the world. Remember, John, the apostle, said by the same spirit, they are of the world, therefore speak they of the world, and the world heareth them. We are of God, little children, he that, is of, he that knoweth God heareth us, and he that is not of God heareth not us. Hereby know we the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. Okay, so there is a spirit of the world, and there is the spirit of God. The spirit of the world has its manner of speaking, and the spirit of God has its manner of speaking. And those two manners of speaking are completely different. Praise the Lord. Verse 13. Which things also we speak, we, the church of Jesus Christ, not in the words which man's wisdom teacheth, but which the Holy Ghost teacheth. Okay, not in the things which man's wisdom teacheth. Remember Paul said in another place, well, it's right over here in chapter 1. He said, uh, Let's start in verse 20. Let's read chapter 1, verse 20 and following. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this world? Hath not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? Remember, there's a spirit of the world, and there's the spirit of God. Okay, the wisdom of this world is foolishness. Praise the Lord. Verse 21, for, that, for after that in the wisdom... This is like my favorite verse in the whole Bible. <laughs> but my favorite verse changes every day when I read another verse. But now that I see it, this, today, this is my favorite verse. For after that, in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. Isn't that awesome? For after that, in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. Wisdom, okay? The world by its own wisdom knew not God. The world has decided that God is something else than he is, and so they've decided to make up another God, create a God of their own imagination. For after that, in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. See, the wisdom of God knew that the wisdom of men is foolishness. The wisdom of God knew before the foundation of the world that men were going to invent their own wisdom, rejecting the wisdom of God, and invent their own God and their own concept of God and reject the truth of God's word. And for that reason, God chose the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. Not that preaching is actually foolishness, but it seems to be foolishness to those who are of this world who consider themselves to be wise, but are actually fools, as Paul said in another place in Romans. Verse 22, For the Jews require a sign, and the Greeks seek after wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified unto the Jews a stumbling block, and unto the Greeks foolishness. Listen to that. The Jews require a sign, don't they? The Jews stood before Jesus and said, Show us a sign if you're the Messiah. And Jesus said, An evil and adulterous generation seeketh after a sign. If they had really been looking for signs, they would have seen them all over the place in the wake of Jesus of Nazareth, because he is the manifestation of the word of God. But they didn't want that. They wanted something else. They wanted magic. They wanted entertainment, like the people have in the churches today. I digress. I won't even go there. For the Jews require a sign, and the Greeks seek after wisdom. The Greeks are those that are... It's, it's not only a word that means the people from Greece, but it's a word that also refers to all those that are Gentiles, Jew and Greek. Those words are used in contraposition or contra juxtaposition to each other um, many times in the Scripture, Jew and Greek. So Greek in the Scripture is, is not necessarily a word that just refers to people from Greece. It's a word that means the Gentiles. Jew is a Jew and Greek is a Gentile. Okay, and I'm not perverting the scripture or twisting it around. Check it out and see that, that what I say is true. Okay, so the Greeks are those that are not Jews and they seek after wisdom, but not the wisdom of God, 
their own wisdom, philosophy, and vain deceit, like Paul said in, 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 um, in uh, Colossians. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Colossians chapter 2, starting with verse 8. Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit after, after the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. See, the Jews require a sign, the Greeks seek after wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified unto the Jews a stumbling block, and unto the Greeks foolishness. Why is it foolishness unto the Greeks? They seek wisdom. Why is it foolishness to them? Because the wisdom of this world is foolishness with God. When men begin to imagine or take it upon themselves to imagine what they think God should be, instead of submitting to him and receiving his kingdom as a little child and letting him reveal it to them, then their wisdom is turned into foolishness. And the truth, when it's preached to them, is perceived by them as foolishness. This is what theologians are. Theologians are the Greeks that seek after wisdom, but refuse the wisdom of God. And you'll see that more and more as I continue. Let's go back into chapter 2 of 1 Corinthians. Um, and I was in verse 13. Which things also we speak, not in the words which man's wisdom teacheth, but which the Holy Ghost teacheth. Okay? Not in the words which man's wisdom teacheth. It doesn't matter how well you can speak, or how literate you are, or how, how, how eloquent you, you speak, or how great an orator you are. As you can tell that I'm not really a great one. By the way, that I stumble sometimes with my English, but... Thank God I do speak English. No thanks to the public school system. Oh, did I say that out loud? Yes, I did. Um, seriously, I thank God for my mother who taught me to read and write and do arithmetic when I was four years old because I certainly would have never learned it in, in the public school system. But I digress. Um, not in the words which man's wisdom teacheth, but which the Holy Ghost teacheth, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. Now, in my youth as, as a Christian, that didn't really come out right because I wasn't a Christian in my youth. But when I was a, a young Christian, let's say that, I heard, I was exposed to theology quite a bit. And I was, in fact, quite a budding theologian for the first couple of years after I was born again until Jesus delivered me from the nonsense of theology and had me just to read his word, fast and pray, and let him teach me from his word instead of all that theological nonsense. But what... In those first couple of years, when I was under the ministry of, of some theologians, I heard them use this verse of Scripture comparing spiritual things with spiritual, and I thought that it meant taking one verse of the Scripture and comparing it with another verse of the Scripture. And even though there's nothing inherently wrong with that, if you are a man of God and you're searching the Scriptures, there is something wrong with it if you're not born again and you profess yourself to be a Christian but have never obeyed the gospel of Christ, and your supposed, your professed knowledge of God is not from having a relationship with him, it is from theology, from the study of God. Now, let's look at the word theology. It comes from the Greek word theos, and it means the study of God. Okay? The study of God. Well, that seems like a good thing to people that don't know the Lord, the study of God. Let's put him on a pedestal, and let's study him. Okay, let's take them apart and put them back together. Let's study Greek and Hebrew, even though we don't speak Greek and Hebrew. Let's read books that were written by ungodly men and who profess to know Greek and Hebrew, and let's read their opinion of what the Bible says rather than seeking God for ourselves in his word. That's what theology is. It is witchcraft. It is the, the perversion of the words of the scripture using misinformation based on languages that you have never learned. That's what it is. It's purposeful deception. But comparing spiritual things with spiritual does not mean, when you're a theologian, comparing one verse of Scripture with another verse of Scripture. What it means is deep calleth unto deep. And you're not going to understand this if you're not born again. Okay, Deep calleth unto deep at the noise of thy water spouts, say the Scripture. When you read the Scripture and you're born of that word that you're reading, it cries out to you. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. The word of God is spirit and life. Jesus said, the words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. See, in the sixth chapter of John, that's why so many people in the Protestant and Catholic religions think that partaking of the Mass or the Eucharist is the act of eating Jesus Christ's flesh and drinking his blood. Because they don't understand they're not born of God's word. They're not, they can't see his kingdom. They don't understand that the words that he spake unto them were spirit and life. That he wasn't talking about his, the flesh of his physical body. He was 
the word, the word of God standing there in a human body, the word of God was standing there saying, he that eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood hath eternal life. It wasn't the Son of God speaking those things of the members of his own physical body. It was the Word of God standing there speaking those things of himself. And at the end, he explained. He said, the words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. But still, there are millions of people today who think that a Roman pagan priest has the magical power to transform uh, bread and wine into the actual body and blood of Jesus Christ. And they believe that when they partake of the, the blasphemy of the Mass or the Eucharist, that they are eating and drinking Jesus Christ and receiving forgiveness of their sins. And that's blasphemy and it's backwards. And the Word of God says nothing like that. Jesus never said anything like that. But they think that because they think that comparing spiritual things with spiritual means to take one verse of Scripture and compare it with another verse of Scripture, even though you're not born again and you can't see the kingdom of God. How are you going to compare one part of a kingdom with another part of the kingdom if you can't even see the kingdom? But if you can see the kingdom, it's because you have a revelation from God. And when you read the Word of God, which is spiritual, it bears witness with the Word of God which is in you, that same Word of God which is alive in you, the life is in you. So when you read the Word of God on the pages of the Holy Bible, the fact that the Word of God that you're reading is also living and inside of you bears witness with you and shows you the truth. That's what it means, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. If you're a theologian, you have no idea what I just said. But if you were born of God's Word, you understand exactly what I'm saying. I praise God with you. Hallelujah. Thank you, Father. Okay, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. But, verse 14, But the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, neither can he, excuse me, but the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him. Neither can he know them, for they are because they are spiritually discerned. Okay, the natural man. The natural man is that man that is not regenerated. He is not born again. Except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. If you can't see the kingdom of God, then it's pretty much in vain for you to be reading the word of the kingdom because you're not going to understand it. Okay? Now, I shouldn't say that. I should say this. Forgive me. If you're not born of the kingdom of God, but you want to continue to pretend that you're a Christian anyway in your pride, then it is vain for you to study the word of God as if you were a Christian. Okay? It's not a vain thing for you to read the word of God, if you have a humble and meek heart and you desire to learn more of God, that's a wonderful thing that you read the Word of God, even if you're not born again yet, because this Word is the seed that will cause you to become born again if you seek Him with all of your heart. And I'm not saying that you can by your own will become born again, but if you seek, you will find. Praise the Lord. And this Word, not this book, but the words that are in this book, are the seed. The Word is the seed. The seed is the Word of God. Luke chapter 8, verse 11 being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. 1 Peter 1.23 James 1.18 Of his own will begat he us by the word of truth, that we might be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. The word is the seed. Praise the Lord. A man that is born again is born of the word of God. He's not a Christian yet, but he's born again so he can see the kingdom of God. And if he can see the kingdom of God, then he can hear the gospel repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ and receive remission of his sins and the Holy Ghost. Blessed be the name of the Lord. But the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God. This is like the Greeks. To them, the, the preaching of the gospel is foolishness. Okay, When you preach the gospel of Jesus Christ to a theologian, to him it is foolishness. He has so many vain arguments to offer you, and he'll say that you're that you're a baby, that you don't understand Greek and Hebrew, that you don't understand the Word, and he's been studying the Word for decades, more than you've been alive, and on and on and on, and yada, 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 yada. But all you've spoken to him is the pure gospel of Jesus Christ as it is written in the Scripture, and he mocks at it, and he scoffs it, and he cannot see it. Why? Because it is spiritually discerned. Deep calleth unto deep. Comparing spiritual things with spiritual. The words that I speak unto you, said the Lord, they are spirit and they are life. Jesus said to the Pharisees, the ones who were doctors of the law, who knew the scriptures backwards and forwards, he said, why do you not understand my speech? Even because ye cannot hear my word. See, they are of the world. Therefore the world Heareth them. Therefore speak they of the world, and the world heareth them. We are of God, little children, 
He that is of God heareth us, and he that knoweth not God heareth not us. Hereby know we the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. Blessed be the name of the Lord. But the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him. Neither can he know them, for they are spiritually discerned. Neither can he know them. Neither can he. He is not able. It is not possible. Listen to this. It is not possible for him to know these things, the natural man, because they are spiritually discerned. It is not possible for a natural man to discern spiritual things. No matter how much he studies, no matter if he is fluent in Greek and Hebrew and Aramaic, and English and French and German and Italian and every language in the world, no matter if he has lived for 2,000 years and was alive when Jesus Christ was on the earth, or lived 3,000 years or 3,500 years and was alive when Moses was on the earth and has studied all those 3,500 years, it doesn't matter. It's not possible. It's not possible for the natural man to know the things of the Spirit of God, for they are spiritually discerned. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Now let's go to Isaiah chapter 28. I'm going to finish this up. Isaiah chapter 28, verses 9 through, I think, 13. 9 through 13. Whom shall he teach knowledge? He, God. Whom shall, to whom shall God teach knowledge? And whom shall he make to understand doctrine? Why is doctrine so important? It's because the doctrine of Christ is the gospel of Christ, and it's what we ought to know and cleave to and preach to others so they can be saved. It is the teaching that Jesus Christ gave to his holy apostles to teach to the world. He said to them, Go ye therefore and teach all nations. That's doctrine. When you teach, you're teaching doctrine. A teaching is a doctrine. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. This is the doctrine of Christ. Well, whom shall he make to understand doctrine? Here's the answer. Them that are weaned from the milk and drawn from the breasts. Remember Jesus rejoiced in spirit one day, as written in the New Testament. He said, I thank thee, O Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that thou hast revealed these things unto babes and kept them hidden from the wise and prudent. For indeed it was thy good pleasure to do so. It is the good pleasure of God to keep the things of his kingdom hidden from the so-called wise and prudent of this world. He will despise the proud, and he will exalt the humble. Jesus said, Except ye receive the kingdom of God as little children, ye shall in no wise enter therein. As little children. Little children aren't proud, and they don't say, well, I've been studying ever since I was five, and I'm nine now, so I know way more than you. Children don't do that. If you teach them something, they go, okay, and they drink that up. Okay. And if they're wise as they grow older, they'll, they'll check things out as you teach it to them. But, but when you teach children little, when you teach a little, I do speak English, when you teach things to a little child, he isn't proud, and he doesn't say, oh, yeah, yeah, I know that already. I learned that like 10 years ago. They learn to do that when they're teenagers, but when they're little children, no. When you teach them something, they receive it. So be careful what you teach them. Whom shall he teach knowledge, and whom shall he make to understand doctrine? Them that are weaned from the milk and drawn from the breasts. For precept must be upon precept, precept upon precept, line upon line, line upon line, here a little and there a little. This is speaking about the theologians, the doctors of the law, the Pharisees, the ones that considered themselves wise in their own eyes. Verse 11, for with stammering lips and another tongue will he speak to this people. Oh my goodness, Isaiah said this 800 years before it happened, and it happened on the day of Pentecost. For with stammering lips and another tongue will he speak to this people, to whom he said, this is the rest wherewith ye may cause the weary to rest. Yet they would not hear. Yet they would not hear. Who's they? The Pharisees, the theologians, the unbelievers within the body of Israel and today within the churches. This is the rest wherewith ye may cause the weary to rest. What is the rest? It's the Spirit of God. It's the, it's the state of being in Jesus Christ, being saved from your sins and knowing that he has done it all. 
Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain. He washed it white as snow. That's where the rest is. We that have believed do enter into rest, the writer of Hebrews said. It's not on a day of the week. It's in Jesus Christ. He is the Lord of the Sabbath. This is the rest. What is the rest? For with stammering lips in another tongue will he speak to this people. Speaking in tongues is what happens when you receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. This is the rest and the refreshing. Yet they would not hear. Theologians won't hear that. When you tell them what the Bible says about what happens when you receive the Holy Ghost, they reject it, they mock it, they scoff at it. They tell you that you're stupid and that you're ignorant and that you don't know the scripture and that you don't understand theology. They reject the gospel of Jesus Christ. Yet they would not hear. Let's go on. 13. But the word of the Lord was unto them precept upon precept, line upon line. That's what the theologians think comparing spiritual things with spiritual means. But they don't understand comparing spiritual things with spiritual because they're natural. They don't have the Spirit of Christ in them. They're not born of the Word of God. They don't have the Word of God living in them. So they can't compare spiritual things with spiritual because there's nothing inside them to compare it with. So they imagine that spiritual things with spiritual means precept upon precept, line upon line. This is speaking of them. Verse 13, Isaiah 28, 13. But the word of the Lord was unto them precept upon precept. Precept upon precept, line upon line, line upon line, here a little and there a little. Isn't that how they built the Tower of Babylon in a figure? Listen, that they might go and fall backward and be broken and snared and taken. The next time, little children, that you hear a theologian tell you that the word of God is precept upon precept, here a little and there a little, Remember the rest of this verse, that they might go and fall backward and be broken and snared and taken. That's what happens to the people who believe that the word of God is precept upon precept, line upon line. They go and fall backward and are broken and snared and taken. They are trapped in their own foolishness. The wisdom of God is foolishness to them that perish. The gospel of Jesus Christ is foolishness to them that perish. Theologians are not Christians. The difference between a theologian and a Christian is as clear and distinct as the difference between summer and winter, the difference between east and west, the difference between darkness and light. There is no such thing as a theologian who is a Christian. And I know that they will disagree and they will believe that they are Christians. Well, that's up to them. That's between them and God. But we who are of the Spirit of God, we who are of the Bride of Christ. We know from the Scripture that a theologian is not a Christian. God is not a statue on a pedestal to be studied with the sciences of men. And I'm not speaking against science, but there is a science in the Bible that's called science falsely so called. I shouldn't say there is a science in the Bible. I should say there is a thing in the Bible called science falsely so called. It is not true science. It is false science. The difference between true science and false science is very clear. True science is when people take actual things and facts and they examine them and come to a conclusion based on the actual evidence. False science is when a conclusion is already assumed and so-called facts and evidence are manipulated and created in order to back up the theory that was assumed to be the hypothesis by the person who calls himself a scientist. That's the difference between true science and science falsely so-called. Okay? Theology is science falsely so-called. It is the art of people who are unregenerate and not born of God in their feeble efforts to study God, to open up his word when it is a sealed book and they cannot perceive it, they cannot receive it, they cannot know it because it is spiritually discerned. But yet they try to figure it out. And the only way that they can do it in their carnal understanding is by the, the, the method of precept upon precept. They call it theology. They call it hermeneutics. Okay, It's precept upon precept, precept upon precept, line upon line, here a little and there a little, that they might go and fall backward and be broken and snared and taken. It is not possible for any person in the world to know God through theology. You cannot, you will not ever know God through theology. 
Theology is nonsense. I'm not speaking against the study of languages. I am not speaking against studying the scripture. Of course not. Studying the scripture is very important. What I do speak against is books of a theological nature, books that tell you that if you don't understand Greek and Hebrew, you can't properly understand the scripture, books that tell you that the scripture was mistranslated and that it really ought to be translated another way. Okay, If you speak English, the King James Version of the Bible is the Word of God. It has not been mistranslated. There are no words in it that, are, um, that, that have been mistakenly translated in the wrong way. It is the Word of God. And if you're born of God, if you're born of his word, then you know that. If you're not born of his word, then you'll believe everything that comes along. You'll be tossed about like a, wi like a wave of the sea with every wind of doctrine. See, But if you get what you know from God because you're born of his word, then you're rooted and grounded. And when people come to you and they bring this doctrine and that doctrine, no matter how well they may preach it, no matter how eloquent they are, no matter how many thousands of people follow them because they speak so well, you're going to see right through it. And you're going to know that's not my father's word. Blessed be the name of the Lord. It's like when they train treasury agents to detect counterfeit bills. They don't give them every counterfeit bill in the world to study. That would be impossible. What they give them to study is the actual thing, the dollar bill. Okay. And when they study that, and they study it well, then whenever a counterfeit comes, whatever the nature of it is, however good of a job it is, they will recognize it right away. If ye continue in my word, said Jesus Christ, then are ye my disciples indeed, and ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. When Paul said, Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth, he was talking about studying the scripture. He wasn't talking about studying theological works of men so that you could be filled with all sorts of words and phrases that aren't in the scripture and all sorts of doctrines that God had never even imagined in his heart. He was talking about searching the scriptures, studying the scripture, reading the scripture day after day, because the words that I speak unto you, say the Lord, are spirit and they are life. So you're either a Christian or you're a theologian. Or you're just a sinner in the world, of course, but discounting all the people in the world that don't profess themselves to be Christians. You're either a Christian or a theologian. You're not both. You can't be both. If you're a Christian, you despise the witchcraft of theology. And if you're a theologian, then the gospel of Christ is foolishness to you and you mock it and you scoff at it because it doesn't make any sense to you. You cannot receive it. You cannot. It's not possible because the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God. Neither can he know them for they are spiritually discerned. I hope this message has gone forth to ears that will hear and I'm here for you if you have earnest questions. My name is Clinton. In Jesus' name I give you this message. Peace to you who love Jesus Christ in sincerity.